All right, let's turn to the book of James. It's good to see everybody here tonight. Thank you. Response from the audience. My iPad's on 59%, so hopefully make it. Hope it has endurance. The book of James. Perseverance. Perseverance. That's right. Made J- Joe made himself giggle. All right. So, there's a place in New Mexico where they are building a storage facility for nuclear waste, plutonium. It's uh, leftover material that we use to make, like, atomic bombs, things like that. So, they have to store this deep down in the earth. The problem is, it's going to be, like, toxic for, like, 10,000 years. So what they, they assembled a team of engineers, graphic designers, and even like science fiction writers to create a sign, to create a way to communicate to people far in the future that there's a danger deep below. And so they, and one of the tasks that's interesting is they can't assume that America will exist 10,000 years in the future or that English will be the language that people will speak. So they got to create a sign that is universal, that can be understood by whoever comes in the future. And some of the ideas are a little crazy, okay? One of the ideas is to create like these, these structures, like spikes, to look dangerous and threatening, but not uniform, kind of like jagged, you know, thorns, to kind of give this... Um, communicate the idea that there's something deadly underneath the earth. Another crazy idea is um, they want to create like a religion and have like a a priest. And this would spread out in the area and genetically modify cats so that they would glow if radiation is released in the area. And you think, my, my initial thought was just do skull and crossbones, that's like the universal sign, like there's danger below, right? Back in the day, like pirates, that was their sign that there's treasure underneath. Words change. One, at one point in time, awful meant good. Like you're full of all. This is a good thing. Now, awful's terrible. They needed to create a, wor- a, a, a sign that would communicate there's danger below. So I think from the last thing I read, and this is, they're supposed to do this in like in the 2030s, they, they're trying to keep something low-key and hope for the best, pour a lot of concrete, and just enroll with it. They needed to make a sign to help people understand there's a danger underneath the earth. And there's a sign or a gauge, a, a, a warning light, as it were, of what is below. And what we're going to read about tonight in James is that we kind of have that. James is saying that you can know when something's going wrong in your heart. And he says it's our mouth. What, what comes out of our mouth shows us what's going on in our hearts. So um, if you're in the book of James, we're going to read that in a second. James says there's a way for us to understand if someone is a toxic person. It's a telltale sign of what's going on in their hearts. And also it's a way for us to check our own hearts to see what's going on in us. If you have a pattern of using words in a way that's destructive, this passage is going to let us know that there's some heart issue going on that you need to deal with. There's something toxic that's going on deep below. James' concern in this book is for us to live out what we claim to say we believe. So before we camp out, and we're going to get into that in James chapter 3, before we camp out, I want to do a quick overview with James chapter 1 and 2. So before we hit that, let me pray, and then we'll do that. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the practical nature of the book of James. I pray that you would bless our time right now. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of James in the New Testament, it's an epistle written by James, the brother of Jesus. It's practical and ethical in nature. Many consider it the Proverbs of the New Testament. It has a natural flow from a heart that is in step with the gospel. If this is true and you believe it, 
you're going to do these things. So here's some highlights. If you boil the book down to one sentence, this is it. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Be doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourself. So James chapter 1 is about trials and temptations, difference between trials and temptations. Trials come from the Lord. Temptation comes from your own sinful heart. Trials are to build us up. Temptations arise in us to tear us down. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say he is tempted. I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But, verse 14, but each person is tempted when he's lured away and enticed by his own desire. James lets us know that God will give us trials to strengthen our faith, to test our love for him. Trials come from God. Temptation comes from your heart, sometimes even in the midst of that trial. Verse 14, but each person is tempted when he is lured away and enticed by his own desires. God brings difficult things to show us how spiritually fit you are. You think you know a lot of truth, but are you really applying it in your life consistently? And this is, this is why God brings these things into our life. Like, do you think that, is it helpful to you knowing that this is the Lord bringing something difficult in your life? This is a question for, for you guys. Is it helpful to know this? This is what James is saying. Is it helpful? Why is it helpful? You know what's good for you? You know what's good for you? Yeah. This is a good plan. God knows what's best for me. Do we like it a lot of times? Nope. I mean, does it feel good? But it, in my mind, it helps knowing that the Lord has a plan through this difficult thing. And it's to be expected. And God's going to produce something good out of it. And this is why he says, count it all joy at the beginning of this book. This is why Christianity is so different than anything else in the world. We're not trying to get this information to avoid pain. Our Lord says, I'm going to bring it in to refine you, and I'm going to give you perseverance to go through it. James doesn't want us to be weekend warrior Christians. Weekend warrior, like, you know, you do your own thing during the week, but in, when it's Sunday, you put your best on, you come in here, and we praise the Lord and all that stuff, and then um, you go back and put your Bible, and it just collects dust, and then you come back and Where's my Bible at? It's in the car where you left it from last Sunday. He is concerned that readers are self-deceived. Verse 22, 1, 22. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You say you're a fruit tree. Show me your fruit. And this is, this is why we need to listen carefully tonight. This is why you guys need to listen me and myself, I need to listen. Some of you know a lot of truth from Scripture, but James is about to say something shocking. What does, he, what does James draw, um, the comparison that he draws with somebody else who knows a lot of truth? What, else com- what, what, is, what comparison does he draw that somebody knows truth but is not saved? Answer from you guys. Bonus points. We, had, we didn't read it. Do y'all remember? Even the demons believe and they shudder. Look at verse 218. But someone will say, I have faith. I'm mean, sorry, you have faith. I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You pass the theology test. You did well. Even the demons believe and they shudder. You could be just a well on the status of a well-informed demon. You know a lot of truth. You know God is one. You know true things about him. But your life is, doesn't look anything like it should. The point is that you can know a lot of truth about God, but if you don't bear fruit of the Spirit, you're in the same category of a well-informed demon. All right, so that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, 
faith and works. You like that transition? Just here we go. Faith and works, the relationship. Paul says in Romans 4, 5, you can look at that if you want to. Now to the one who does not work. Sorry. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credit as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited to, as righteousness. That's James in Romans chapter 4, verse 5. The one who does not work. And then you, in James, look at James 2, 23. Abraham believed God and is credited to him as righteousness, and he was called, a, called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. And so, do y'all see that? Not by works, but by faith alone. And then James is saying, you need to, it's not by faith alone. So a lot of people say that this is a contradiction. A lot of cults, a lot of people who say that if you're going to be saved, you need to do good works, they go to these things. James is pointing to something else. If I said, pick or it didn't happen, what, what, what do I mean by that? What am I asking you for? Picture or it didn't happen. You make a claim and I say, you know, it's a meme. Okay, I'm trying to be cool with you guys. I'm trying to use your slang. Pick or it didn't happen. What does that mean? Show me proof. Like, justify this statement. You met a celebrity at the Waffle House, pick, or it didn't happen. Like, justify this, this claim. Justify the statement. This is what James is getting at in this book, wh- how he's framing this based on the context. Look at verse 25. In the same way, and think about this. If it is salvation by faith, look at Rahab in verse 25. In the same way, not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for, oh, sorry, in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a di- different direction. So she's Rahab, she needs to hide the spies of Israel, and she lies, and she sends the bad guys off in a different direction. Did she... It, was this the moment when she was right with the Lord? No, it's the fruit. This is her showing that she is believing the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She's on God's team, and this is fruit of that. This is not the moment when she was justified before the Lord. She's just in, in the sense of justification, like Paul's talking about, but what James is talking about. She is proving that, that she loves the Lord. This is how James is using the word justify in his letter. The focus on the type of faith that we claim to have. Paul is focused on the roots. Jesus is, he justifies us by his work, not ours. And by faith, we are looking to him and are right because of his works, not ours. And James is focused on the fruit, the type of faith that is justified. Do y'all see the difference? Okay, I know this group is smart. Y'all, y'all are well-informed demons. I'm just kidding. Y'all know the difference there. The fruit and the root, okay? Paul points to the roots. James is pointing at the expectation of fruit. If your faith has no fruit, no signs of life, or is constantly bad fruit, you have no life in you. James 2.18, 2, I will show my faith by my works. That's a very clarifying statement in, to show what he's been talking about in chapter 2. All right. Well, let's go to chapter uh, 3 of James. What we're about to unpack is important, I think, for your relationships, for your marriage, future marriages, uh, job, and walk with the Lord. Look at James 3. We're going to read 1 through 12. How to use our tongues. Again, James is saying, James is concerned that just because you know a lot of things doesn't mean you're going to live it out. And a telltale sign of what's going on in your heart is your mouth. What's going on deep below the surface. Verse 1, not many of you should be teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with stricter, with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, 
able also to bridle, bridle the whole body. If we put bits in the mouth of horses so that they obey, obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a, is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and a reptile and, and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no, no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. For the same mouth came blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, and a grapefruit pr produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James' concern is our self-deception. Verse 9, we bless our Lord and then curse a person in your life that you don't like. If you can do that with ease, there's something wrong deep in your heart. So listen, and I want it all to take a sober assessment of yourself. Finish the sentence. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but... Words will never hurt me. Words, thank you. Words will never hurt me. Is that true? Is that true? No. It's not. Why is it not true? Because words hurt. Words do hurt. You're right. They hurt. James is saying that words can cut deep in the heart and change someone's life for the good or bad. Verse 5, it's, it, it's, like, it's like someone tossing a small match and burning down entire national forest. Look at verse 5. So the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. In other words, you can say a word to somebody, and that word changes the, per, the person's perspective of themselves for positive or negative. Verse 6, and the, sun, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. What's a world of unrighteousness? A world, a world of bad. A world of bad. What does the Bible say that is? Hell. Hell. You're right. Thank you, Rowan. Verse 6, and the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. He's just not using like flowery language here. He means what he says by by hell. James is saying that we shouldn't have a flamethrower on our face torching people. You sound like someone destined for hell if you're spewing hellish venom. James wants his readers to repent from being a hell mouth using t the tongue like the devil does. When you do this, you're drawing on something dark and evil that is the epitome of godly godlessness. You know what it sounds like. You're an idiot. You're so stupid, right? James's fear and my fear and all, our fear from this passage is that we're well-educated demons, weekend warriors. When it really comes down to it, we don't show the fruit of the Spirit. We have bad fruit, but we can pass the theology test. You know all the right answers. But when a trial comes, and God brings in a trial of a difficult person, what comes out of your mouth is venom. 
And you, you failed the trial. You failed to be refined. And we see what's in, you see what's in your heart, and everybody sees what's in your heart. The sign up above is saying radioactive. There's, there's, there's nasty stuff that is coming out. Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. In other words, James is saying there's something very wrong with this. Where's the good fruit? So, so this is not an isolated place where James is talking about this. There's other places that flesh this out. Ephesians 5.4 Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Your mouth is like an open grave is a phrase from the Bible that appears in Romans 3 and Psalms 5. An open grave stinks, okay? It's rotting flesh and flies and it's nasty. That's what your mouth is, what Scripture says. Set a guard over your mouth, o, set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips, Psalm 4, 141, verse 3. Peter says, keep your tongue from evil. And Jesus, our Lord, has the clearest explanation in Matthew 12, verse 34. For out of the abundance, for out of the abundance, what you have stored up in you, what's flowing, uh, flowing out, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good person out of the good things, good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil things, treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account of every careless word without care, without love, word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned. That's the most clearest statement from the Lord. So what comes out of your mouth is a sign of what's going in your heart. Are you full of venom? Toxic thoughts, hatred, bitterness. Here's why it's important that we get this reined in and you, you, you know this, you know what you're capable of, your pattern, and you repent of it and give it to Jesus. Okay, this is how it's going to affect you going forward in your life. This is from a guy named John Blanchard. He says, quote, It would be easy to show that most of the strife, restlessness, turmoil in society at large in business life, in church life, in family life, and in other personal relationships is caused by people allowing their mouth to stay open when it ought to be kept closed. Do y'all get that? Like, if you get this, if you understand this, and if you're strong in this area, and you're wrestling with these things, you'll know how to navigate life. You're not going to blow things up. You're going to know how to bring peace instead of just continue burning things to the ground. If you're failing the test in cutting, peop- in, in cutting people down, it's just really easy for you, you may not know him. You know things about him, but you really don't love him. If you love him, you will share the love that he has for other people. So what is this toxic tongue sound like? I'm going to just give some concrete examples. You, just, you throw people under the bus. You talk about them. Harsh speech, cut downs, insults. And again, I want to say, like, from the outset, like, we, we joke with each other. Like, we use sarcasm, but you need to make sure that person understands you don't mean it. And sometimes there's things that you don't ever say, even if you have this sarcastic communication that we like to do with each other. Like appearances, just don't go there. It's just, it's not helpful. Harsh speech, cut downs, insults, unfair framing. Like in other words, you always do this. You never do this. You're always, you're always doing this. It's just unfair. We don't always, like, always do this. Maybe occasionally we do it. A lot of times we do it. Maybe there's a pattern that we need to deal with, but to say always is an unfair frame of the situation. 
or you never do this, you never take out the trash. That's not true. Okay. Assuming the worst in somebody, projecting motives, you did this because of this. How do you know their heart? You don't know that. Here's why slander is so bad. We need words of affirmation. All of us do. And you're misusing the gift that God has given you to build others up. God has given you a mouth to build people up, to communicate truth and love to them. And you're misusing it. God wants us to use words to build up hearts, to strengthen souls. Think about this. In the beginning, God is using words to create the world. Now, we're not God, but we're made in his image. And we are called to build and to affect reality with words. Words are the building material of your faith. Think about Romans ten seventeen. How will they know unless somebody tells them, uses their words? How will they come to know Jesus unless some preacher uses words to communicate the truth? God uses those words. Words are used to build each other up. This is what encouragement is. You're using words to confirm and build up someone who's not quite solid in their hearts. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. This is what Barnabas in Scripture is known for. He was an encouragement to people. He used his words to help people form an identity around the person and work of Jesus. So think about this. If someone needs an encouragement, they're in a vulnerable place. They're not as solid. They're not established. And a Barnabas comes along and uses his words to speak truth and build them up. And we need these outside words. We can't just like, I'm, I'm good. Don't talk to me. I got this. We need people outside of our own minds saying, hey, you're doing, this is, this is right. You're honoring the Lord by doing this. Or no, this is not right. You need to reconsider what you're doing. We need that. Words are how you get your self-image, your identity, how you view yourself. Your self-image is a, thing, but it's a combination of words that you've spoken to yourself, that other people have spoken to you, or about you. Some of you can probably remember words that somebody said years in the past, right? And they're still affecting you, either good for good or bad. We need words to form our self-image, and that's why every careless word will be judged, what Scripture says, what Jesus said. Careless, meaning it doesn't mean like a throwaway word or just rambling nonsense. It means a word that doesn't build up, but tears down. It's a loveless word. It's just, you don't care. Words are how we build community. But lying, gossip, and slander burns the connection that the Lord died to bring together. And I, this is, after studying this book, it, it just makes me think, I think the, the devil, the forces of evil, want us to downplay the effects of words that they have on each other. He wants to down, think about it. He wants to downplay the word, what words can do for good or bad. And I, he must be the author that sticks and stones may break my bones. I, I don't, unknown author. I think it's the devil. Your words can impact and shape someone's reality. The Lord wants us to build each other up, image your creator by using words to bless. But many times we use words to destroy and damn. Words spoken in a playful manner can be taken wrongly. Like I said, I like, I like sarcasm, but if they don't get it, or you feel like they're taken the wrong way, don't do that. Like, like, you need to respect them. Your tongue is like a proxy for your fist. You know what a proxy is, right? It's a stand-in. You want to hit them in the face, but you know you're getting in trouble with your, by doing that, so you use your words to really get them. And that black eye may heal, but that toxic word is going to be hard to remove. 
words can drain people of their social status, damage their reputation. By your words, you can slowly poison people's perception of a person so that it changes how people see that person in your friend group. What a toxic tongue looks like. Slander, we talked about this. Speaking about a person the way it puts them down. We get mad, right? But do you really want to put them so... Maybe you're really good and you're quick-witted. I'm not. People, like, we get in a sparring match. I'll think of a better come, like, comeback, like, that night. Oh, I should have said this. That really would have stung. You're not that, Okay. Maybe you are, and you're really good. Do you really want to put them down so hard they never get off the mat? You tore them up, and everybody laughed. Is that what a Christian does? James says, you're deceiving yourself if you're really good, and you enjoy doing that. You hit them so hard that their reputation will never get off the ground. Some phrases you won't believe what this person did. You won't believe what I heard about so-and-so. Hey, guess what they said? Hey, don't say anything, but fill in the blank. And then you got this, like, subtle slander where you say something insulting, and then you're like, I'm just kidding. You say it. You say what you want to say, then you reel it back in by saying, just kidding. And it's supposed to be taken back. And then we get, you get irritated because, you know, oh, you're acting like a baby. I said, I'm just kidding. I mean, we do this, right? I know I've done this. Using truth to punish rather than redeem. You know something true. They've done something wrong. And I'm just speaking the truth in love. But you're really using the truth to punish. They sin. But instead of, but you push them down instead of trying to pull them up and bring them to a place of reconciliation. Listen to the voices of hell. The invisible forces of evil say around you, hey, great job with your tongue there. He is an idiot, isn't he? You're justified in saying that to her. She deserved it. You cut him down so well, they couldn't even think of a comeback. And then you went behind his back to, the, to your mutual friends to continue the slander. That was a great way to further the damage to him. She's never going to recover what, from what you said about her. His friends will always think about him in the way that you described him. And the devil will say to you, hopefully he'll start believing what you said and what instead of what Jesus says about him. And they say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Great use of wonderful, careless words. Proverbs twelve eighteen says, a careless word stabs like a sword, but the words of a wise person brings healing. Jesus, James is saying in his book, like, how can you do this? It doesn't make sense. Brothers, it ought not to be. If you know the king of heaven, why do you sound like somebody destined for hell? How can you curse your nearest neighbors, your family, your friends, and then go to church Sunday blessing the Lord? You're deceiving yourself. If you are, if this is your pattern, again, we're not perfect. We all of us struggle with this. But if this is your pattern, and you don't care. I don't want you to think you're saved. Because what, what is showing up on the surface is saying underneath this person's heart doesn't care for their neighbor. Okay? And maybe not changed. A good tree bears good fruit. If your mouth is toxic, your heart is toxic. Does that follow? This is James. This is the Lord. Um, we're a group of sinners. We get together, and there's friction. If there's um, uh, a breakdown of communication, a conflict, 
go to the person that has sinned against you or you've sinned against them. Don't go to the third party and dump all your junk on them. Fix it. Go to the person that you need to talk to. Be a peacemaker. Think about it. No one wears the white hat except Jesus. Everybody has done something. If there's a conflict, usually both sides are at fault and they need to see their blind spots and repent. If you're on the receiving end of slander, now you know what you're dealing with. The sticks and stones thing's not working for you. How do you get over it? Say somebody's really, really lit you up. How can you, and it's still sting, and it's been maybe years. How can you get over this? Think to yourself, why am I putting more weight in what that person said about me than what the Lord said? says about me. You can try to weaponize your, your words and fire back. It's just going to continue this fire and burning things down. Use the gospel on yourself. Colossians 3, 3, 4 says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. Christ is my life. He defines my identity, my self-esteem. I'm not going to look to anybody else and just hope that they say enough good things about me so I can feel good about myself. That's a, that's a fool's errand, okay? Look to the Lord. The gospel frees us from needing their approval. You don't need their kind words when you have the words of Jesus toward you. You're accepted by the person. If you're a Christian, you're accepted by the person whose words matter most. If this is you tonight, and you're the one with the toxic tongue, and again, we all do this, but if this is your pattern, how can you change? Like, it's just so natural for me, and I'm so good at it. You're so quick-witted and smart. You're so good at tearing people down. How can you change? James is saying we act according to what we remember, okay? Remember at the beginning of the book, you, you look at, he, James says, you look at the mirror, you see yourself, and then you go away and you forget. Look at who you are in Jesus. Remember what God has said about you. Store up good things in your heart. Moses tells the people to love your neighbors yourself. Jesus gives a clear, better command. John 13, 34 says, a new command I, I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Like, look to me. If you want to know how to love, look, look at what I've done to love other people. John 15, 13, there's no greater display of love than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. If that's in your heart mode, if you want to do that, I want to lay, I want to, I want to give, my, give myself and lay down my life for my friends. How can I do that? If that's your heart to bless them and love them, them in that way, how are you going to like, at the same time, sharply cut them down? Think about this. Jesus goes down to death so that we can be raised to life. If you want to know how to bless others with your tongue, watch how Jesus does it. Jesus enjoys communication with the Father throughout his ministry, but on the cross, the Father held his tongue. When Jesus called out to him, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why are you silent? He was silent to Jesus for our sake. On the cross, Jesus was receiving the curses of the covenant so that we could be blessed. Jesus used his last breath of air to bless sinners with forgiveness. Father, forgive them. Jesus used his words to plead our case before God and to secure our pardon. If Jesus has given you a new heart, how can you still use words to tear people down? So repent. If you, if you see that it, that this is you, repent on it and, and look to Jesus. And if you have, if, you're, if your heart is repentant and looking to Jesus, there's going to be a time when we are 
with the Lord, and God is going to burst forth in joy and sing over us. And this is, I love it. Sing over us. Don't, don't miss this. This is Zephaniah 317. It's fantastic. It says that God is going to be so filled with joy that he will use his words to sing over us. Isn't that awesome? God delights over us. If that's what you, if you're struggling with that, think about those things. Put the living water on your tongue to put out the fires of hell. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We, we thank you for the book of James and how, how practical it is. Lord, we, we don't want to be deceived. We don't want to come in here and gather uh, information and not do anything with it. We want to bear good fruit. We pray that you would help us uh, to, to show your love. And um, when difficult people comes in our life, we pray that you would equip us, give us a heart to love the difficult person, to seek peace, to honor you. I pray that we would get control over our tongues so that we would have, we would, we would create peace and build people up and encourage them. We thank you for loving us when we were unlovely in the mouth. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.